Good evening and welcome to yet another episode of South African of the Year Daily Show here on ANN7 Channel 405. The show will be going to the lives of extraordinary and inspiring South Africans doing great things across the country through the lens of reflection and progression. My name is Masako Maps Mabonyane. As Maps said, this is a show where we sit down and get up close and personal with our nominees as we count down to the main event on the 25th of November. Take a pro dome, that's where it's all going down. But back to the studio today, we're sitting with a Conservationist of the Year nominee, the EWT Project, the Guarding Project in particular, and our guest is Derek van der Merwe. And where's the job title? Yeah, hi. It's a job title that might take the entire show for us to like dissect and understand, but he is the Conflict Mitigation Field Officer. Derek, yeah. what a mouthful. <laughs> I know, it's true. I mean, I used to struggle with it sometimes. So. <laughs> Derek, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. Um, tell us more about the program, uh, just to make it easier for ourselves to digest and for our, well, our viewers to digest. Well, you know what? I actually work outside of protected areas in South Africa. And if you think about it, um, South Africa's land surface area, only just over 6% of our land surface is actually formally protected. So there's very little conservation work going on out there uh, that is outside of protected areas. So it's very important for us to conserve this wonderful biodiversity that we do have outside of protected areas. So I mainly work in communities on, on farmland throughout South Africa. And I help um, community members as well as farmers out there try and protect their livestock against predators. Because because we do have a lot of predators outside of protected areas and it is someone's job. Someone has to also protect these predators and that's generally what I do. Derek, looking at the beginning, the beginning ish, you know when English is trying to trip you up, the <laughs> beginnings of the project, if we're looking at the guard dogs, why in particular, where did the need come from? What was happening in communities and with the livestock and the particular wildlife that, that, that's in question? Well, you know what? Um, you know, a lot of uh, in a lot of these areas, we um, people were losing a lot of livestock to predators, mm -hmm. and we needed to come up with a method that was non-lethal. And because what a lot of people were doing, they were putting poisons out there, they were gin trapping, they were putting snares out to persecute these predators to protect their livestock. Mm -hmm. So we d we had to come up with different methods and and try and look at alternate ways how to protect their livestock without killing and persecuting these predators. So um, we looked at, at Europe, and um, three thousand years ago in Turkey, they actually started using livestock guardian dogs to protect their sheep against wolves and bears out there and it worked fantastically well. So we decided to take that idea and bring it to South Africa and um, we started bringing these Anatolian livestock guardian dogs which come from Turkey originally and putting them on farms in South Africa and uh, to see if they could protect their livestock against predators. And uh, since we've been implemented it, we've had fantastic results. We've now placed nearly 180 dogs throughout South Africa wow. and on those farms where we've placed these dogs their uh, livestock predation has come down up to 90 95%. So it works fantastically well. How does that uh, predator get intimidated enough by a dog who you'd assume would be completely out, um, out, out strength, um, so to speak, overpowered by a, a bigger, more powerful predator yeah. than, you know, to not want to do anything? No, it's quite interesting, but you know what, predators are, 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 are very scared of getting hurt because as soon as they get hurt out there, they cannot hunt anymore. And okay. if they cannot hunt anymore, they lose condition and they can end up passing away. So whenever there's another threat towards them, they'll generally vie away from that threat and, uh, and rather go for easier prey because as soon as they get hurt, they put in a tough situation and they're really going to struggle to hunt later on. So that's generally what hap does happen. But in, on, in, in actually what happens out there is um, I've had very few of my dogs that have actually got into fights with other predators. Only on two occasions have uh, two dogs got into a fight with a leopard. Oh and wow. Yes, it does happen. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, considering we've got 180 dogs out there, that's actually at not many that's occasions. Minimal, yeah. And yeah. generally, you know, when we have a problem leopard in an area, it's, an, it's a leopard that's really old and it hasn't got any teeth left and it's struggling to hunt its natural prey. That's why it goes for livestock. So that's, that's when we do have a problem out there is when we have these older leopards that are causing damage. Easy target. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Very easy target. I mean, there's clearly a lot that goes into that and we actually got a chance to catch up with you to see what goes into the training and the sustaining of uh, such a project and this is uh, a typical day for Derek van der Merwe and his EWT team. Hi, my name is Derek Punamava. I work for the Endangered Wildlife Trust, um, uh, the Carnival Conservation Program. I run the Wildlife Conflict Mitigation. I am the Wildlife Conflict Mitigation Officer. Mm -hmm. 
this project basically started uh, 10 years ago because on farmland outside of protected areas there was a lot of conflict between farmers and predators and uh, farmers were losing a lot, lot of livestock to these predators and they were shooting them, they were gin trapping them, they were poisoning them and we wanted to offer the farmers a non-lethal method of protecting their livestock and in the same time preserving predators which is a win-win situation for both. But yeah, if you think about it, South Africa is a huge, huge area and only 6.5% of our land mass is actually officially protected. So there's large tracts of land that, that don't go protected and there's very few people working on, on that land to try and conserve our biodiversity, our wonderful biodiversity that we do have in South Africa. So it's very important for us to work with these landowners, community members, to try and preserve um, what, li what wildlife we do have outside of protected areas. We actually bought this concept in from Europe, um, Turkey, thousands and thousands of years ago they actually used uh, Anatolian livestock guardian dogs to protect sheep there from bears and wolves and they've been using it for, for centuries over there and we decided to bring the idea here to South Africa and uh, we started using Anatolians here and firstly in Namibia and yeah, um, you know what, um, these dogs are fantastic. It's a nice non-lethal method of protecting your livestock and we've had great success. From dog training to fundraising, it's all in a day's work for these men and women on a mission. Derek, you, you touched on earlier about the dogs that you get from Turkey, but what kind of to uh, dogs in, in totality do you actually breed and um, how do you actually train them? Mm. Alright, that's quite an interesting question and uh, it's quite complex, but um, we actually use two kinds of dogs in our project. We use Anatolians, which originate from Turkey. Uh, they work very, very well. We've got a very, um, a very well-known breeder up in Limpopo who breeds the dogs for us. She does a fantastic job, so we don't actually do any of the breeding, but we source all of our dogs from her. And then we use a, an African breeder, Maluti, which is interesting. It actually uh, originates from Lesotho, and it's also a fantastic dog. It works just as well as the Anatolian. But um, the benefits of this dog is it's, it's, it, because it comes from South Africa, it's much more resilient to, to tick infestations, to disease, okay. stuff like that. And also, um, it's a little bit smaller, so you feed it a lot less and that way it costs a lot less which is great <laughs> but uh, yeah we use both dogs uh, we've also got a breeder out um, in northwest who breeds with these Malutis and we source all our dogs from them um, but um, these dogs come from very good working lines and they just work very well in the field so it's important to look for a breeder who breeds with a, the right genetics and um, then these dogs to be tra hard to train them it's, it's quite interesting we actually take these little puppies they're between and six and eight weeks old so they're really really small and then we put them with their livestock that they're going to be um, guarding later on and uh, they grow up in a small enclosure we, we put them in a small enclosure with some livestock for about six weeks and then once they formed a bond with that livestock we move them into a bigger area um, generally about 100 meters by 150 meters mm -hmm. and you can actually notice that when they formed a bond with the, the livestock they start sticking together they play with each other it's actually very very cute right. and then once that bond's been formed we open the gates and off they go out into the field with their animals when they're really young you've got to keep an eye on them because um, you could be trampled because I'm thinking a whole cow that's this big and then this little puppy. <laughs> no, it's very, very true. At the beginning, um, the cows don't actually like the dogs. And <laughs> you have to make an area where we actually keep the cows away from the dogs where the dog can escape. Otherwise, the dog can get hurt. So that's very, very important. And a cow's a lot bigger than a small puppy. Yeah. <laughs> but um, after a while, the, there's a fantastic bond before, be, formed between these animals and they play with each other. I've even got photos of a, a dog uh, biting a, a cow's horn, which is so cute. Wow. So, um, and eventually, I mean, these dogs can give you 10 years of, of work out there in the field and uh, it's a fantastic investment for a landowner or community mm -hmm. member and it makes their life easier. Conservationist of the Year nominees, it's the Endangered Wildlife Trust, EWT's Guarding Dog Project. If you'd like to vote for them, CONS3 is their code. SMS that to 43043. You can also email CONS3 to satyvoting at nnc com and don't forget by voting you stand a chance to win a vip experience to the awards and you want that because tickets are not going to be on sale but derek was talking to us about how the dogs are trained let's actually go and see what happens out there on the field right now the process of uh, of, of breeding the um the Maluti mountain dogs basically what you do is you must have decent parent stock so you start off with uh, decent parent stock that are able to be, uh, adapt and bond with livestock from there, the puppies are born with, within the kraal, 
or within the environment where the stock is and you raise them up to about six to, to ten weeks dependent on, on when you're ready to place them. Carnivores are very important in the ecosystem. They are a very important piece of the puzzle in keeping the ecosystem in balance. So they, they do weed out the weak and sick and they do control prey numbers. And in areas where there's no large carnivores, prey numbers are inclined to get out of control and then they in turn eat too much and impact on the vegetation. So it's all part of this really, really fine balance that nature has for itself. Our Livestock Guardian Dog Project was initiated to help farmers who are having damage from carnivores um, on, their, on their animals. So the idea is to find ways that the farmers can farm without having to kill the carnivores, but at the same time not have any loss to their livestock. So wow, what does our Livestock Guardian Dog Project do in a day? Well, a lot. So we've got the dogs out in the field who are working, protecting their livestock and making sure that carnivores don't eat the livestock. We've got farmers who look after those dogs and take care of them. They feed them and dip them and make sure that they're healthy. We've got Derek, who's our field worker on the project, who monitors the dogs and makes sure that they're working properly and gathers data on the dogs on a monthly basis. Then back at head office, we're capturing that data, we're analyzing the data, we're examining trends in the dogs and, the, and, the, and how much area we're covering and how many dogs we have placed and which dogs are successful and which dogs aren't. And then to do all of this work, we require funds. So we're fundraising, we're writing reports to donors, we're writing funding applications, we're feeding back to people who've sponsored dogs. We're trying to raise awareness around the project, so we're posting on Facebook, we're writing newspaper articles. So yes, we're very busy and we're certainly not bored, but it's a project that we all feel very, very strongly passionate about. So every stitch of work that we do, be it balancing budgets or purchasing puppies, we do with, with a big smile on our faces. This project benefits lots of role players. First of all, the farmer benefits because he's making more money out of his farming practice. He's also able to leave his livestock, know that they're safe, and not have to spend extra time trying to protect livestock from carnivores, so he can carry on with more important farming activities. So certainly, at ground level, the farmer benefits. Also, carnivores benefit, because now suddenly carnivores can live alongside livestock farmers. They're not being shot, there's no poison being put out, there's no snares, there's no traps. So carnivore conservation as a whole benefits. And there's also knock-on effects for other species um, on the farms because often the farmers in desperation will throw out poison. And poison has massive impacts throughout the food chain. So vultures can be affected by poison, the smaller carnivores, anything that scavenges on that carcass. So really the benefits are across the board, um, even as far as the consumer, so that you know if you're eating meat that was produced using livestock guarding dogs, that it was done in a nice green, um, environmentally friendly manner. So when you have your Heritage Day braai, you can do so with, with a clean conscience. A lot of the conflicts exist because the farmers don't have information, which you think in this age of Google, everyone's got the information, but they actually don't. So a lot of the time, it's from a lack of information that builds this conflict. Um, and also a lot of the time, the conflict comes because expectations aren't being met. So often the farmer expects to lose nothing to predation. Then he loses, say, 10 animals. And it's that gap between expectation and reality that causes that conflict. So we try to do several things. We First of all, we, we work with in, in communities on a long-term basis, we don't just come and go. So we've been based in Mpopa now for well over 10 years doing this work. So the farmers get to know us, they trust us, they trust the organization. Remember to please vote for the Endangered Wildlife Trust's Livestock Guarding Dog Project in the ANN7 South African of the Year Awards. Help us save our large carnivals. Conservationist of the Year nominee, the EWT Guarding Dog Project. With us in the studio, Derek van der Merwe, who is a Conflict Mitigation Field Officer. I got that right without even looking at the paper this time. 
and I'm going to make an attempt at that, to, at, to, at that too. I can't even get that sentence out of my mind. Um, but Derek, as you know, we have you in studio as the conflict mitigation field officer. Look at you. What are your duties exactly? Well, I work across the country, actually. Any um, community member or landowner out there who has a problem with predators, particular predators, because I work for the conservation prob uh, conserva Carnival Conservation Program. <laughs> See these words up so fast. But if they have a problem with any um, predators out there, they come to me and, and, um, and we try and uh, help them out with a solution for them to look after their livestock. Well, Derek, we've seen that it has been going really, really well over the last uh, seven years. And you've had great interest from farmers across Mpumalanga and Limpopo really buying into the project of actually having um, livestock guarding dogs, dogs, <laughs> dogs, protect their livestock and small flock of of, um, of, of herds of livestock and um, we actually got a chance to speak to some of the farmers and see how this has benefited their actual group of livestock and how important this initiative is. I'm Alan Retief, I'm a cattle farmer and I had, we've always been farming cattle and in the last few years we've suffered big, big losses to, live, uh, to predators. Uh, two years ago I lost 16 calves in a, in a season and that's when I decided to look at alternative ways of looking after the cattle. I'd known about the Livestock Guardian Dog program for a while and I met Derek at a show and we spoke and then he said that they would give me a dog to try out and so I've had this dog for over a year about a year and a half now. Last season I only lost four calves to predators. Um, it's made a big, big difference. Uh, the, the predators know there's a dog around because he, he, if there's something around he barks and they, they don't want to go into a, an area where they know there's something else that, that's in that space. Um, it's been a good, big success over here. Some farmers use different means of controlling predators. Some people use poison, which is indiscriminate. It can kill anything from your own animals to a whole lot of non-target species. And uh, other people shoot. Um, both those me methods are totally illegal. Um, so this, this method of uh, predator control is much more environmentally friendly than anything else in that the predators are still around but they, they don't cause that, that much conflict anymore and um, the livestock are there and uh, the losses are drastically reduced. I've just received a second puppy uh, which is now an Anatolian who um, is eight weeks old. Uh, my first dog was a Maluti. A Maluti is more adapted to the African environment. He doesn't suffer from tick-borne diseases as much as the Anatolian will and she'll grow a bit bigger. Um, so we're going to now put each dog with different herds so that they can protect each, each herd because I run a, a number of herds on the farm. It's the South African of the Year Daily Show 2016, sitting down with phenomenal people who are doing extraordinary work. And today, conservation is what we're talking about. You know, sometimes I get so nervous about that word because I'm like, conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but we are looking at the EWT Guarding Dog Project and we're sitting down with Derek van der Merwe. Derek, you've clearly made a really big impact on the, um, the, the livelihood of the farmers themselves as well as their livestock. What were some of the inspirational um, stories or one of the big differences that you've seen an impact um, from your uh, EWT project uh, that has really made it all worth it? You know what, I, I actually came from a farming background myself, so I understood some of the challenges faced by, by farmers. I mean, it's your livelihood at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and in communities out there, I mean, the number of cattle you have in a herd is your bank at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And for a predator to come into that area and to, to take out two, three of your animals, it really, really hurts. So um, some of the biggest challenges we have faced is, is poisons, gin traps, um, just some of the inhumane methods that people were using to... to, um, to um, 
to persecute predators. It was mm. terrible. And you know what? If you go out there with a non-lethal method and, and there's nothing better than if you do have a problem animal and you capture it and you relocate it to a certain area where, where you can release it, that feeling you get when you release an animal back into the wild, giving it a second chance, mm. it's just an amazing feeling. Passion and purpose. That's what we're getting here from our man, Derek. And if you'd like to vote for this project that's doing such wonderful things in the conservation space, please get voting. SMS CONS3 to 43043 or email CONS3 to satyvoting at nn7.com but they're not alone in this category there are uh, six other nominees yep. I almost said seven but the total is seven so let's have a look at this category and how you can vote Well, you know, at the end of the day, we want to get all farmers on board out there. Um, we want to produce meat more uh, environmentally friendly. We want to get poisons out of the farming uh, and communities. We want to get gin traps out. Of, we want to get all the in, indiscriminate, um, inhumane methods of, of, of persecuting predators. We want to get that totally out of the system. <laughs> Welcome back. We're still in studio with Conservationist of the Year nominee Derek Fundamover, the Conflict Mitigation Officer of the EWT uh, Livestock, Livestock Guarding, Guarding Dog, Dog Project. Project. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of words to learn today, guys, so we're just putting it all together. Derek, you know, we were speaking earlier off air before the, where the, the interview started and about how this really is something that it's a calling. It's like being a doctor, a nurse, um, because as you said, you're probably not going to make a lot of money out of it in terms of your career, but it's a satisfactory feeling knowing that you do what you do. For a young person who's out there looking at you, thinking to themselves, Derek, I want to be like you. How do they get into the project? How can they possibly get to work with EWT to see if this is something that they'd like to do for the future? You know, Brucey, I couldn't agree with you more. I think I do have the best job in the world right now. <laughs> but, you know, a conservation is very difficult. I, I would suggest they hang in there, they volunteer, they get involved as much as they can in projects. And um, you know what? You would develop a passion for something and to hang in there and to choose a species which really interests you. Mm. That's what I would suggest to them. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it, being a conservationist, we don't earn the most money in the world, but you get to see the most amazing areas. It's not a normal nine-to-five job, but you're out there in the wild a lot uh, and and uh, you're seeing absolutely what we have in South Africa. We've got wonderful wildlife heritage. You're out there spending time with it. It's not a nine-to-five job as well. Uh, you don't sit behind a desk, which is fantastic. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, conservation is it's a passion. It's yeah. a calling. And, it's a, you know, it's one of the few careers left where you can actually really make a difference and look back at your life one day and realize, actually, you contributed to saving the species or helping save that, that animal. So it's a, it's a fantastic job. Part of the solution. Well, Derek, uh, speaking of looking back at your life and, uh, you know, seeing just how much uh, you've uh, enjoyed it, let's just see how much you can look back at your life now and see if you've gained that knowledge of South Africa because we have a little fun <laughs> game that we play here, which is our trivia section of the show and we ask you how much you know about South Africa and your general knowledge because of course this is the South African of the Year show so we want to know if our nominees know enough about South Africa. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna we were gonna keep it within your um, your, your industry and see and, and see if, uh, if if it's more fair like that to, to really challenge you on those questions. I bet you everyone is sitting at the office right now like Derek please do not let the team down. <laughs> no pressure. Question number one, what is the fastest land animal? I mean, Derek. This is definitely a cheetah. Yes! <laughs> you go. It can reach speeds of 120 kilometers per hour. Crazy. Which is the smallest of the nine provinces in South Africa? It's definitely Gauteng. <laughs> <laughs> the smallest in size, but the biggest in population. Isn't yes. that true? And also what's really interesting is that um, the biggest province um, has the smallest population. The too. Northern Cape, right? Northern I mean, Cape. If exactly. I'm looking at the map right now, yeah. that looks big. <laughs> uh, next question. How many toes does a white rhino have? Wow. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. I don't really work on rhinos, but <laughs> I would say there are four. Close. 
Tomatoes. It's three. three. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Which province in South Africa has the largest man-made forest? Man-made forest. Wow. In the world. It could be two. It's either Mpumalanga or Limpopo, one of the two. Ooh. Wrong. KZD. Johannesburg. Oh, wow. The largest <laughs> man-made forest in the world. Where's this forest? It, no. <laughs> so, basically, we've planted the most trees within an urban space in the world. We have over 10, I think it's, um, wait, 100,000? Wow, wow, 100, wow. 100,000 trees just... All over. See, yeah, Derek, it's incredible. fine. Even the host gets. <laughs> yeah. I even get educated on this show. <laughs> that's another thing. I mean, Joburg has, has what, the largest city in the world without a, a permanent water source. So that's very interesting. That is it's insane. Real, All right, final question. I'm hoping this one that is right. That doesn't count up as a mark Annie. for you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> with your own questions and trivia. <laughs> South Africa has the second highest waterfall in the world. What is it called? I think it's Tugela Falls. There we ah, go. My man, three <laughs> out of five. <laughs> the total drop of the Tugela Falls is 948 meters. If you don't know, now you know. Three <laughs> out of five, that's not bad. I was just making sure you wouldn't say that last Nothing. <laughs> 60% are passed. <laughs> Derek, you've already achieved a lot with uh, EWT uh, Livestock God, Dog Guarding Project. Um, or, I need to get that order right. Garden Dog Project. That's the one. And um, you have already made the leaps and bounds that you've wanted to, but what do you guys still want to achieve and where do you see the project going? Mm. Well, you know, at the end of the day, we want to get all farmers on board out there. Um, we want to produce meat more uh, environmentally friendly. We want to get poisons out of the farming uh, and communities. We want to get gin traps out. Of, we want to get all the in indiscriminate... Um, inhumane methods of, of, of persecuting predators. We want to get that totally out of the system and we want to um, help farmers out and we want to, well, at the end of the day we want them to produce more meat at the end of the day and we want, um, we want them to live in, in harmony with predators. So that's, that's our end goal at the end of the day and I hope that one day we can achieve that. I certainly hope you continue doing the great work that you're doing, Derek. Now, I, I asked you this question off air, but I'm waiting to hear what the answer is because you never answered me then. But you're nominated in a category with six other nominees who also are all doing great work, you know, from the Eco Solutions Township Our Project to Valpro. If you were to win the award, who's the conservationist of the year 2016? <laughs> That's a really tough question. Um, you know what, at the end of the day, I think um, all conservationists are on the same side. It's, it's not really a competition. We've got the same end goal, and that is to save uh, species out there. And um, I think at the end of the day, we're all winners. And uh, I really want to uh, congratulate them on the work and keep, keep doing the work that they are doing. Because at the end of the day, we're doing work for, for animals which don't really have a voice. And, uh, and really just continue doing the great work that they're doing. And I'm just happy to be nominated. So. Thank you very much, Derek. And do yourselves a favor and do go to the website and check out all the great work that they're doing. They've got a fantastic gallery there of uh, what their livestock uh, guardian project, dog project, gets up to. Mm. And um, you might be lucky enough to get in touch with Derek himself. And he'll show you a photo, which we spoke about um, offline during the ad break, about him getting bitten on his backside by an elephant seal. <laughs> remember, remember, if you want to vote for them, their numbers are CONS3. And you can do that at 43043. Just SMS to that number. But we'll be seeing you again on uh, South African of the Daily Show, but for myself, Maps Maponyani, good night. Obakano Komba Ravele, thank you so much for watching Dima Dekwana Ah.